Hi, uh, my name is Julia De Silva, Programs and Scholarships Associate with Triangle Community Foundation. Joining me today is my colleague, Sarah Battersby, Senior Scholarships and Educations Officer. Uh, thank you for joining us for episode four of our new podcast. Today we're gonna to talk about students and how they've been impacted by COVID-19 academically in their job search um, and what the wider community implications are because of their connection to our education system. Um, we've invited some great folks today to join us to give both a system and individual's perspective on this topic. Um, we're so happy to have our two panelists with us today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, so let's start with Maria. Hi, um, my name is Maria Peralta Porras. Um, this past May, uh, I graduated from Guilford College um, with a double major in public health and sociology. Hi, I'm Megan Gonzalez-Smith, and I'm the Executive Director of the Durham Public Schools Foundation. Great, so let's jump into our conversation today. And Megan, let's start with you. Um, since you work with schools and students all over Durham, we'd love for you to share the trends you've seen across the county, um, and what adjustments have students and families had to make during this time? And what do you feel are the largest areas of need? Um, so our public school families, which in Durham are majority black and brown, are facing multiple crises from coronavirus to the epidemic of racial violence in our country. And when schools closed this past spring, our school district, our students, our families had to quickly pivot to remote learning, which requires so much infrastructure and support to be successful. And now that we're headed into the summer, families are facing increased economic hardship and tough choices about the safety of returning to work and the uncertainty of what school may look like in the fall. This crisis has really highlighted and exacerbated long existing inequities. For our whole Durham community to thrive, we need people to make a living wage, to have access to quality health care, to have affordable housing. These are critical fundamentals for creating the conditions at home that allow our students to thrive. So even though those are you know, really huge issues that go beyond the scope of the Durham Public Schools Foundation, we know that we have to name them um, and be thinking about them as a community when we're thinking about the challenges challenges that our students are facing at home, um, which are tied to the challenges that their families face. The supports that our students most need in this moment that we're hearing from our students and families in the Durham Public Schools community um, are really two big things um, that have been lifted up over and over. So one is access to social, emotional, and mental health support, and the other is access to high quality digital and remote learning. On the first point, we know that these crises are really traumatic for young people and we can't expect them to engage in learning without first meeting their mental health needs. And to the second point, uh, access to high quality digital and remote learning is both really essential as we look to an unprecedented fall where we don't know if we're going to be in school or have a regular school schedules and also it's really important long term for our school districts for ensuring that our students develop technology skills that they need for today's jobs and that they're able to still engage with learning at home out of regular school hours. So when we're thinking about this, the needs around uh, digital and remote learning, this really goes beyond a device and reliable internet, which I think is where our minds go first. And that's really the starting point. We also have to invest in growing students and families' digital literacy skills so they can utilize those devices once they have them. And really importantly, we have to invest in ongoing professional development for our teachers so that we're setting them up for success in delivering high quality remote digital instruction, which really requires a very different skill set than teaching in person. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, we now want to turn to our student, or I guess recent uh, student uh, on the panel, Maria. Um, as a recent graduate, can you share your experience as a student? Um, I guess it was in your last semester of college when all of this started and um, just talk about what changed at school and uh, what was that adjustment like? Um, yeah, I can speak on it. Um, so all of this happened um, 
a week prior, it was my last week um, before spring break. So there are some universities that um, they got their notice um, and so they were able to move out. Um, but I didn't know that the last time I was going to be in a classroom was like the last time I was ever going to be in the classroom. Um, so it's definitely a touchy subject. Um, everything just happened all at once. Um, and I felt like there was not a lot of support for fellow seniors um, because not only were we trying to grapple with like we're about to venture off into the adult world, um, but also um, with this pandemic, a lot of recognition, celebration that um, college uh, is a really big accomplishment. Also coming from a first generation um, daughter of immigrants, um, this was a really big win for me. Um, so it was really hard to just finish a chapter without having closure. Um, and then transitioning into um, online learning was very difficult um, because our curriculum was set up to be in class and a lot of the, and we were winding up towards the finals. Um, so we had a lot of pressure to bring forth that effort of finals, but being trapped at home um, in the sense that most of us were off campus so we had our routines. I would always be in the library, um, but sw sw switching that and trying to find new um, study space here at home. Um, and in general, it was a lot of grieving. Um, it was a lot of grieving for me and a lot of my fellow classmates. Um, and even then, like when we were told we, we weren't gonna have a, a graduation, that was very um, painful to experience. But the transition, um, was really abrupt so but I'm really thankful for my professors who um, the ones that I had were very understanding and really tried cutting back on some of the um, load because it was a lot for us and I'm pretty sure it was a lot for my professors as well um, also my school was very good at um, trying to provide um, emergency funds um, because of the their People who were providing didn't, were losing jobs. So at least my university was, um, or college was really um, good about giving emergency funds. Um, but it was, it was all just at once, so it was really overwhelming. But yeah, that's a little bit of how it's been through a student's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that sounds like a really um, sad and difficult way to end um, your college experience. Um, and now as a graduate, you're, you're also looking for a job or maybe you've started a new job. And so um, what does that process look like you know, for you or for some friends? You know, how have you had to adapt that kind of that job search period? Um, yeah, so even prior to um, COVID breaking out, I remember being in um, webinars with you and like asking for advice on how to do cover letters and like doing, I felt like I was in the timeline that my older friends who had already graduated went through. So I knew that path, like that was simple. Like I knew there was going to be bumps in the road, but I wasn't expecting um, my path to change. Um, and it's frustrating because it's not like I could turn to someone who graduated last year and be like, how'd you do it? Um, because in reality, like no one know. like it's just different because of this pandemic. Um, and so at the beginning with everything happened, um, I, along with other um, seniors, were just kind of discouraged to apply altogether um, in the sense that we were grieving and just like very angry. Um, we even created a support group for like us seniors to just talk about how frustrating everything was. Um, but now that it's been a few a few months, um, I, along with other seniors that I know of, we've been able to like go back. Um, and specifically for me, I'm really thankful for your foundation's emailing list. I think it's called the, I don't remember the acronym, but it's, um, it, it's for nonprofits to put in job postings and stuff. That's been super helpful, the most helpful, more helpful than LinkedIn um, personally, um, just to get more, um, information about what's going on here locally um, because even though Greensboro was my home for four years coming back to the triangle it feels it feels good to have support from um, your foundation to have some postings and now that everything's gone a little better um, it's more postings have come out so I've been able to apply to more jobs um, but it's definitely been difficult and there's also been like positions that before COVID happened um, they were uh, taking in new members but then when COVID hit um, there were two particular positions that said they had no more funding, so they couldn't hire new people. Um, so it was really 
um, hard just to see, like, um, I think now it's gotten a little better, but at the beginning it was just very, it hit everyone, uh, specifically the nonprofit sector, um, which was where I was focusing on for post-grad opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great segue. We know that so much has changed in the past few months, just unbelievably, and no one is really sure um, moving forward what things are going to look like in the short and the long term. So for both of you, um, what are your greatest concerns for students and families moving forward, thinking three, six, 12 months from now? Uh, and Megan, let's start with you. Yeah, well, my greatest immediate concern is uh, still people's health. And we're seeing COVID-19 cases continue to rise in North Carolina, while at the same time, things are opening up more and more. Um, and I feel really concerned about that. Um, you know, we know that our Black and Latinx community members who are already being the most impacted by COVID-19 are also the most likely to be essential workers and to work in industries where they're being called back to work right now and facing really difficult decisions. And people shouldn't have to choose between uh, their and their family's health and, and safety and their economic security. Um, and I, I'm really deeply concerned about learning loss for students, which is why I think we have to prioritize digital equity immediately. Um, and I would say I mean, my greatest hope in this moment, um, you didn't ask for that, but I'll share that too. Um, I, I try to hold on to that as much as I can as well. And my greatest hope in this moment is that major disruptions like this one that we're experiencing can also create an opportunity for reimagining what our institutions and society can look like. We see so much of that happening right now as our country reckons with police violence against Black people. This can also be a moment where we reimagine what public education can look like to allow us to realize our vision of schools where every student can develop a love of learning and every student has space to really dream big and let their brilliance shine and schools where every student can develop the skills to realize their dreams. I believe that public schools can be that and that this moment of major disruption, if we choose to embrace it, can create opportunity for us to really reimagine what public schools can be um, to really live into that full potential. Great, thank you. Maria. Um, yes, um, so through a higher ed perspective, um, even though I have graduated, I have a lot of friends who um, will still go back in the fall. I also have a brother who will be going off to college in the fall. Um, and something I've noticed is just um, school, many higher ed institutions saying that they'll reopen and let students back in. Um, but if I hadn't learned anything from being in the dorm halls is that um, with just health wise um things go around like especially like when it's flu season and stuff like once someone gets in the dorm everyone gets it um so i'm very worried about the safety protocols um i know that my college at guilford they're trying to um, go all the way to thanksgiving break and then go um online learning again um but it's very difficult trying to put trying to do it online um so um just how is that transition going to work? Um, because it's not only draining for students, but also the professors that have to make accommodate everything. Um, so I think those are like one of some of the biggest concerns that I can think of. And then I guess um, how that changes um, price wise, because high, like going to college and like university is really expensive. And if there's going to be these changes, how does that impact that, especially um, when it talks to financial aid and stuff? Um, it could be really impactful. Um, so having that transparency, because I'm not seeing a lot of transparency from the schools. Um, I'd love to hear what gives you hope too. I think that's, that is an important piece of this. Um, I think, I think what, that's a hard question. Um, you answered <laughs> it really well, Megan. Um, I guess like I'm, I'm a huge optimist and like, I think that this kind of highlights like what thing, how we can reimagine um the world and like um just things don't have to be a certain way we can think of them and do them differently um and i'm very optimistic that like in the future this will be a great story to tell um people that i didn't go through this um and i i want to say it could be like a sign of resilience 
um, that regardless of a pandemic, I was able to graduate and like regardless of the pandemic, like students were able to do that and graduate and move on to the next um, um, year and see how far technology can take us. I think that's one of the things that makes me optimistic. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Is there anything else anybody would like to say before we wrap up? Um, well, I actually just share, you know, some of the things that you all shared are um, really important considerations. And I know at the foundation, we've seen uh, donors and we know of other community members that have been adapting to meet these needs. Um, we actually have a quote from one of our um, scholarship members, or actually the scholarship committee, the Juanita McNeil West End Scholarship, um, really speaks to this. Um, so I'll share it. The series of events that have unfolded over the last few months, the COVID-19 pandemic, Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and national protests have placed an undue emotional, financial, and mental burden on families whom already face significant obstacles to achieving our American dream. Disparity factors such as income inequality, underfunded schools, flawed criminal justice system are all byproducts of systemic and institutional racism, which no one person or family can dismantle alone. It takes collective action. As stewards of a fund that is intended to serve students and their families, we had to challenge ourselves to go above and beyond, to think beyond the longevity of the scholarship fund and to rise to the occasion to support students and their families in this moment of great need and momentum. We had to remind ourselves of our power to affect change, our privilege as educated leaders, our obligation to community, and our duty to be responsible stewards. Um, and I think this was great. And just to add some context to that is typically this scholarship um, awards just a couple um, um, scholarships each year. And this year they, they raised the bar and awarded um, several scholarships um because um need in the community and i'm seeing that and so that's something that gives me hope um uh, seeing that this year and we're grateful for that response from our community absolutely um and so but we wanted to give both of you the chance to share any uh, websites or social media channels or upcoming events um, that you would like to share with the community uh, so that they they're aware uh, well, I'll share that the Durham Public Schools Foundation will be um, launching a, a major initiative and focus on digital equity um, starting this summer and, and over the course of the next year. Um, and so folks can follow along with that work and how to support it and be a part of it and also find out about other work the foundation does at bullcityschools.org. Um, and we're on social media at Bull City Schools. So folks can follow us there. Mm -hmm. I can't, um, one organization that I'm thinking off the bat um, is uh, the Golden Door Scholars Program. Um, they're really active on Instagram and um, they specifically um, do work for, for, for DACA students and document students. Um, and throughout this whole situation, they've been really good about giving advice about um, online learning um, and just like focusing on um, bringing more information also just bringing awareness about what's going on for the immigrant communities, as I am part of the immigrant community. So um, if that could be a helpful tool for anyone. Awesome, great, thank you. Well, thank and I'd also just like to thank Triangle Community Foundation for all that, all that you do for our whole community, um, creating spaces and conversation like this, um, and all of, all of the myriad ways that you support our community's greatest needs, um, including during times of crisis like this. So thank you so much for making this space. And thank you both for, for being here and for sharing your time and for being wonderful partners for the foundation. And we've enjoyed having you, so. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Thanks.